to the people who live there, and you're from up there, but they're not down here. Anyways, Michael Hayden, Hayden uh, is now a member of the Chertoff Group, um, and he, but he is the ex-director of, uh, of Central Intelligence, and uh, I put him on the same side with Mike McConnell, who is another ex uh, intelligence official. He was the uh, director of national intelligence, so that's uh, kind of the super body of intelligence that oversees uh, 16 different intelligence agencies or groups, departments in the U.S. federal government. Um, both have come at this from different perspectives. Of course, both are working at uh, companies that uh, get a lot of money from providing consulting and, and uh, uh, contracting services to the federal government. So you have to take that uh, in stride when you listen to their comments. And I think, uh, so Mike McConnell has gone on record as saying we are at cyber war, but in effect he was really just referring to the massive amount of espionage that's going on. Michael Hayden is on record now as saying that cyber espionage is not cyber war, and he's saying, you know, it's good on you if you can engage in cyber espionage effectively because it is uh, lower cost, uh, uh, certainly very, very low risk to date. There have been no diplomatic repercussions from uh, cyber attacks until post-Google Aurora when Hillary Clinton actually came out and, and uh, at least on the side, uh, criticized China for their attack, uh, involvement in those attacks and started to put the pressure on China. Haydn also called for uh, international cooperation, and I think the time is right for that. I think uh, there has to be high-level talks and uh, very technical talks uh, about the Internet and security, cybercrime in particular, um, so that law enforcement agencies in different uh, countries can work together to track down uh, perpetrators of some of the credit card frauds and, uh, and spam attacks and all the rest. All good stuff. Um, and at the high level, uh, Haydn was calling for uh, treating DDoS attacks the same way that, that international cooperation treats chemical warfare, something that uh, has a onus attached to it. Um, since the most DDoS attacks seem to be uh, uh, assisted in ways by crowdsourcing, might be hard for the international organizations to do that, but, but they could, right? They could use um, uh, some control over their international networks to filter out attacks coming from uh, from their organization, their countries. So that was uh, Michael Hayden joining the debate on cyber warfare. Let's move to industry news. Uh, every week uh, I get pummeled with uh, presentations and heads up on uh, new announcements, and I wanted to share with you um, some news about uh, source fires. So source fire now publicly traded. Um, and I reported uh, excellent quarterly numbers, I think 39% uh, increase in revenue year over year. Uh, so doing extremely well. They're on track to do uh, 120 million total in revenue. Um, I always find source fire interesting because I treat them as kind of standalone. I mean, frankly, they are uh, still an IDS company. Um, but in the IDS space, other than Cisco, they don't have a real competitor, right? The IPS vendors are creating a, kind of a, just a different space, you know, where they're filtering out worms and not worrying about uh, so much the uh, detection and tracking and logging and reporting and all the rest that uh, is so cumbersome about IDS. So last week at Black Hat, they introduced Razorback. So this is a overlay framework for their Snort IDS solution, and as described to me in, in the slide, uh, it, as a framework, it's open um, and it provides ways for multiple products to talk to this, this overlay management console, um, and it's got what they call a defense routing system at the core, so this is gathering uh, these detection nuggets. Uh, collection nuggets, uh, basically from different components, and I assume it could be, you know, their IDS, Snort IDS, and other things that detect, detect, uh, attacks, mostly signature based, but some could be flow based, uh, whatever, because these are open APIs, plugging them all together. Uh, they pull them all together, and then the defense routing system is set up to uh, create what they call response nuggets, but that's just other APIs that plug into 
uh, your firewalls and your IPS to push out defenses against these new things that you might see. So it's, it's attractive. Um, the source fire told me that, you know, they came up with this thanks to, um, you know, requests from their existing customer base. Now, uh, I'm, I've never been a huge fan of huge, uh, you know, security infrastructure solutions. And if you remember, the this is sounds similar to what Checkpoint had with their so-called OPSEC ecosystem. And the idea there was all the security products would work together and the, the response and, and defense routing system of the day was the Checkpoint Firewall 1. So in a sense, it's similar, but I think overall that, uh, you know, it gives SourceFire a, a bigger solution, gives them kind of a competitive position against ArcSight, even though I, you know, I assume they're going to uh, work and play nice with ArcSight in a system like this. And it would give them a larger presence inside their, their existing customer base. So we uh, you know, look forward to seeing how people adapt to it if it were you know, adapted by the open source community. Um, that could be a good thing. Other industry, industry news, uh, so Boeing acquired NARIS, uh, it was announced several weeks ago, but they completed the announce, uh, the acquisition. And, uh, you've got to remember NARIS is a, uh, network monitoring and recording tool. And, uh, NARIS is probably their biggest, uh, uh, publicity, uh, was not necessarily positive when uh, they were identified as a technology solution that the NSA embedded in AT&T's uh, points of presence, in particular in San Francisco, um, and the NSA was basically scanning and recording uh, Internet communications that went through AT&T's backbone, which is a significant portion of traffic in the U.S., um, and basically giving them the ability to hunt for keywords, bomb, and Al-Qaeda and whatever else. Um, and that uh, company, and presumably those contracts, uh, have been acquired by Boeing. So Boeing is, you know, one of the top defense contractors in the world, and it, uh, it highlights, uh, or at least I'm going to focus on stuff like this because I've been predicting, and I believe there will be many more acquisitions of security technology vendors by defense contractors. How can they not? Because the federal government is uh, slowly ramping up its interest in cybersecurity. Uh, there's huge budgets assigned to it. Um, and as they do that, the guys with the technology are going to try and, you know, at first just brand themselves. Hey, you know, we're, we've are we got this great technology, so we're experts, and you should hire us. It gives them an advantage in capture of these big contracts. Um, but at some point, there'll be acquisitions made that are actually accreted to their revenue. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all if some of the very large security vendors got acquired. Don't forget the Boeings and Lockheeds, uh, Martin Marietta's of the world are, are companies that uh, way, way overshadow uh, security vendors in size. So, you know, you might have a, even a Mac fee um, with, I don't know, the market cap's probably about $5 billion dollars. Um, being a potential target. And that, you know, heck, at these levels, semantic could be acquired by a Lockheed. Yeah, so don't be surprised if uh, large movements like that happen. Um, there's a rumor out there, one's, you know, one they won't write about, but that's the advantage of uh, coming to the cyber defense uh, webcast here on Bright Talk is I will talk about them. And in this particular case, there's a rumor that HP is going to make a very, very um, a large uh, disruptive acquisition of the security space. And I checked to make sure this is not the HP buying McAfee rumor that's been around for at least five years. For some reason, always crops up in February. I'm not sure why, but you always hear that. It's almost as, as common as the uh, Internet modem tax uh, um, uh, urban legend, I guess, that gets spread around. So, no, um, it's not that HP might be doing something. For that matter, Dell. Um, made their security announcement uh, last week, and that uh, Dell has partnered with Juniper, and it's going to be you know, branding, uh, OEMing uh, Juniper UTM devices, and working with uh, SecureWorks to provide a management uh, security, managed security service uh, to Dell customers, which frankly makes a lot of sense. 
That was interesting news. Let me wrap up quickly here with uh, upcoming events. If uh, you've got time this afternoon in 35 minutes, um, I'm going to be doing the second of five days of lectures uh, as part of Internet Evolution's 60 Days of Executive Education program that they're doing. Uh, and if you, you know, it's free and you sign up and you hear these 30-minute lectures from various experts, um, they're going to do smart grid stuff, cloud stuff, um, you know, a lot of a lot of good uh, background information from experts, and then they turn it over to a text chat channel that they've set up on the site internetevolution.com. So just go there and log in, and uh, you'll hear me talking uh, today about uh, security architectures, building resilience in the network, going beyond uh, vulnerability management. Um, next week's Cyber Defense webcast, same time, same place, uh, online here at the Bright Talk channel. I am going to be presenting from the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And then also next week, uh, that evening, um, on August 10th, 6 p.m., there's a, a Cyber Warfare panel, Defending the Electronic Frontier in the 21st Century. That's in McLean, Virginia. Um, go to cyberwarfare.eventbrite.com to uh, register and then show up and it'd be great to meet you. So thank you very much for joining me for this week's weekly cyber defense webcast at Bright Talk.